we're having an international camp here in 2023. Uh, they're celebrating the 100th anniversary uh, of Soul Size Birth in 2023. Uh, and so um, definitely I hope as many people as possible can come and I'll make sure we have a barbecue and, uh, right here in the unit so you can come and visit. Especially my Patreon friends, if you're here for the camp, I'm going to have a special... Um, a special gathering for the Patreon community as well. So anyway, today I want to talk about a block is a lock is a blow is a throw. But by showing you those um, crates there, the milk crates, I just thought of something. For a long time as part of the camps, I've been doing instructionals on using a milk crate for self-defense. Of course, Patty, I, I kid you not, in my opinion, these humble milk crates are the best self-defense weapon in the world. So here we have the humble milk crate. Why is it such a good self-defense weapon? Because they're strong as, they're made of hard plastic. They are they create a wall, a cage, you see? So if someone was to have a knife or a stick, you can use them as, and it adds an extra 30 centimeters or so of protection, okay? So there's that protection that you have. Also, if you swing it, there's zero wind resistance or very little because of all the holes so that it doesn't slow down if you were to swing something as big as this if it didn't have holes the the wind resistance would slow it down to the point where it probably wouldn't be effective but with all these holes it's incredibly effective and here's the clincher they're on every street corner in every city in the world it doesn't matter where you go and because i'm always thinking milk crates i can't help it i'll be in any city anywhere in the world you'll still see milk crates around Slightly different shapes and different sizes, but they're everywhere. So if you're ever in a situation in the street, just keep running till you find a milk crate. And there was a situation in Sydney, uh, maybe 18 months ago or so, where someone, probably crazy on drugs, who had had a knife and was stabbing people. I think he actually killed someone, stabbed someone to death. And it turns out that a couple of guys bailed him up and the way they did it was with a milk crate they were able to control him deflect the knife and control him with the milk crate but these are really worth thinking about it doesn't take a genius just grab a milk crate yourself play around with it get a feel of it feel the handles feel how you can use it get someone to use a plastic knife and have them attack you as violently as they want and you use the, the milk crate to block them off and then you can just drive them back like this and then if you're able to uh, control them you can literally hold the, the milk crate on their head or hold the milk crate on the arm that has the knife in it very effective us pal good to see you from germany so there you go now the theme a block is a lock is a blow is a throw where does that yes <laughs> A, a milk crate cutter. <laughs> Gaza, the full cream crates swing slower than the low fat ones. <laughs> Very funny. Okay, they'll give you that one. That's a real dad joke. Look, a block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw, is just a concept that we came up with, or I came up with at some stage there. I'm sure other people have thought in similar terms. But the whole idea of. Uh, the whole idea of um, uh, bunkai is taking the principles of kata and transferring them, breaking it down and transferring them to a realistic, usable, practical technique out of the kata. And as you know, um, the the as you know the the uh, problem cutter is that if you get locked into the line you get locked into the cutter and the movement and you only see the punch for the punch and the kick for the kick well then you're losing 
an incredible amount of opportunity um, to uh, take advantage of other areas. So, for example, the upper block, and I use this as a simple example all the time, the upper block can be a block, it can be just hands together, they can swing, a block of stick, it can be a forearm jolt across the, the chest, it can be an elbow right on the, the jaw, it can be a lock to take down and you can turn that lock into a takedown and a throw. So one of the reasons that I've fallen in love with focusing my training on kata and bunkai is because I approach it from this viewpoint of a block is a lock is a blow is a throw. So I'm really interested to hear people's viewpoints and what they think about this. Us, Ken, nice to see you. And Paddy, hope all's well. Paddy's in lockdown again. I got a Victoria. Man, my heart goes out of you. I don't know how people are surviving. Um, anyway, good luck. So um, a block as a lock as a blow as a throw opens your mind. And the easiest way to begin doing that is take any kata, your favorite kata, whatever it may be, and take one technique from it and say to yourself, how can this be turned into a lock? How can I transfer this into a strike or a blow? And how can I continue that movement and take it into a throw? And if you constantly think laterally like that, it'll make a huge difference. I think sometimes what I do in the dojo is I'll break people up into groups of three and four. And rather than do it, you know, the front line is black belts, the second line is brown belts, and then colored belts and so on. I don't break them into those groups. I break them into groups down here. So you have a black belt and a brown belt and maybe a green and a yellow and a white belt. And you break the groups up and you ask them to analyze a kata from the principle of a block is a lock is a blow is a throw. And someone in that group will love the idea of throwing someone to the ground. Someone else will like the idea of locking them up and choking them out standing up. Someone else will just like the idea of hitting them with elbows hard as they can but that working together in a group you'd be absolutely amazed at uh, some of the ideas that people bring out of kata were kata originally created with certain taxi te techniques in mind i have no doubt that's virtually 100 percent guaranteed but we also need to remember that the okinawan masters and sometimes they took a lot of these kata principles and movements from China, but the masters that created these were often very disciplined and very experienced in multi-faceted martial arts. So a lot of the karate masters from Okinawa were fifth, sixth dan in judo. So they had this concept of the, of the grapple, the stand-up gakute grapple and so on. Yes, good on you, Patty. Though I think the mental health, I was actually going to do today's session on mental training and so on because it, I think the lockdown is just breaking people's hearts left, right, and center. In fact, uh, the, bill, the, the removalist who's been with me all day um, had a phone call during the day. It was his father and his father's business partner had committed suicide because of the financial stress and strain um, of COVID. Such a sad, sad thing. So um, good on you, Patty, and stay in touch if I can do anything. Um, I will. Having said that, Queensland might go into lockdown any second. But anyway, I think it's really, really valuable. And next week, um, I'll attempt, if I can find a fall guy, I'll attempt to go through some uh, technique uh, so that we can explain explain the principle. Adam, no! What are you doing? 
I was talking about you all yesterday. I had a caught up with a friend whose daughter is in Pattaya, I think. She's doing Muay Thai, but she got into BJJ. Her boyfriend's a Brazilian guy, and she started doing BJJ. Now, I was talking to her dad, Ketz, good buddy of mine, and I, I don't know what the standard of her BJJ instruction in. Maybe the guy's a fifth Dan black belt, I don't know. But I said, look, if you're in Bangkok and you want to train, go and see my buddy Adam Kayum. And he actually wrote your name, Adam Kayum, down. He even spelled it correctly and wrote Bangkok. So, and here you are, you've popped in. It's so good to see you. I hope you're well and safe and Bangkok's doing okay there. Us Matus, lovely to see you too. So how's everything going, Adam? Everyone can see Adam there. Adam is a, uh, a high-level BJJ instructor and also a Muay Thai uh, instructor, but we trained together when I was first starting BJJ back in 93, 94, 95, 96. I can't remember around that time. But anyway, Adam, thanks for coming along, man. Hope you're well. So a block is a log is a blow with a throw. And, and the, the intimate connection to the five ranges and the ability to transition from range to range is so vital, but it's really valuable. Yeah, dang. I was moving house yesterday too. In fact, I just before you got here, I was showing everyone all the boxes from the moving house. <laughs> but the concept of a block is a lock is a blow is a throw is intimately connected to the five ranges. And the five ranges is intimately connected to the ability to sticky tape and transition. So remember, we, we re referred to the concept of, of connection as being sticky tape. It's like one piece of sticky tape on a box is okay, but if you really want to make sure you're not going to open the box, you put multiple pieces of sticky tape on. Well, the stand-up grapple and the grapple game, the more sticky tape you can get on them, the better. And this is what we call connection. And this connection is intimately connected, is intimately related to your ability to transition through the ranges and therefore apply smoothly the principle of a, of a block as a lock, as a blow, as a throw. Because the same movement, what allows the same movement to be translated, to be interpreted in different ways, is the different ranges. So, for example, if I'm in fighting range and, I, and somebody uses a roundhouse kick or a punch, I can block it with the coxcomb and use my hands like this. Kick comes, boom, block, take it away. If I move in to the range, to the head, butt, elbow range, now that exact movement now becomes an elbow strike. If I keep moving in from range three to range four, the stand-up grapple, Gyakute range, then that, range, that upper block connected with sticky tape with the other hand becomes a throw. Now, if you maintain that connection as you go to the ground, and remember, whenever you go to the ground, your primary objective is controlling your balance, is keeping control of the dominant position. You don't want to take someone to the ground and have them compromise your balance. You want to be able to take someone to the ground and maintain your balance. So you have to maintain the integrity of your balance at all times. But if you're able to lock that upper block movement and go to the ground, well then on the ground, the the various ways that you can use that upper block movement is crazy. See, when you go to the ground, there's only two, well, relatively, and I'm, I'm, I have to be careful because Adam knows more about grappling than I know by a long way. But when you go to the ground, there's basically only two, one or two outcomes. You either land on the bottom or land on the top. If you land on the bottom, you need to deal with the way you took him down for a start. And one thing you'll notice is that in karate, karate takedowns never use sacrifice throws, generally. In all the techniques that Solsai taught with throws, never once 
was there a sacrifice throw? And by a sacrifice throw, I mean taking yourself to the ground first, getting control of their weight and being able to transition and switch that weight. So that idea of going down to the ground is comfortable for grapplers, for some grapplers, particularly BJJ guys. BJJ gives you this incredible strength of being comfortable fighting off your back. So if you do go to the ground and you're on your back, you're actually comfortable. But from a karate perspective, when you go to the ground, you do not want to go to the ground on the back. Remember, you go to the ground, you're either on top or on bottom. For a karate person, you don't want to entertain the idea of being on the bottom until you're much, much, much better. So your priority is always finish on top, maintain balance, control your grips, and that's where that block, lock, blow, throw comes in. If you've got the good grips, you can maintain control as you monitor your balance. And that is a simple thing. If you've never grappled in your life, there's one thing that you can think about all the time is when you go to the ground, you're either going to be on top or on bottom. If the way you take someone down puts you on the bottom, from a karate perspective, it's not good. I wouldn't do it. You can. There's plenty of opportunities to take someone down where you stay on top. So you have to maintain your top position. The flip side is you take someone down who's good at grappling, their expertise is reversing that. So you take them down there on the bottom, they're really good at feeling your weight and turning and flipping you over. So your primary objective once you go to the ground is to maintain your balance. And the way you're going to do that is to control where they grip you and control where you grip them. Adam says 100%. Oh, thank God. I was a bit concerned there. <laughs> but anyway, so does that make sense? A block is a lock is a blow is a throw is intimately connected to mastery of transitions from the five ranges. What are the five ranges? Kick range, punch range, headbutt elbow range, gyakute or stand up grapple range, and the ground range. And if you are working through a block, lock, blow, throw, you have to develop intimate skills at all five ranges. Once you do that, and you don't have to, see Masayama didn't say that you have to become the best judo player. You have to become the best wrestler. He said you have to become familiar with the primary principles and skills of those arts so that if you are in a situation with those fighters, you aren't easily overwhelmed by then doing nothing more than applying their movement principles. And remember, my philosophy is only one martial art because there's only one human fighting body. Okay, what separates what we call martial arts is cultural differences and sporting rule differences. So the rules of Taekwondo are different to Kyokushin, are different to wrestling, different to freestyle, Greco-Roman, BJJ, Nogi BJJ, uh, um, boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai. They're all exactly the same. If there is a technique in one of those arts that fits another, you can bet your bottom dollar they'll use it. Okay, You've got some of the best Muay Thai fighters in the world are using high-quality karate tick kicks. You've got some of the best Muay Thai and kickboxers in the world are straight dead set boxers and some good Muay Thai fighters are champions at both Muay Thai and boxing. Okay, so there is no rule to say that you can't use a technique from another art if it fits yours. The only difference is the rule set and, and the movement and training principle. Okay, so this is all very, very Yes, exactly, Rob. Not a happy place to be. Um, even from a, even from a, the perspective of a well-trained grappler in the street, if the other person even has a fundamental notion of how to control you on the bottom, the street is not a grappling mat. It's cement and it's bitumen. So a lot of the things which would normally have no effect to a grappler 
will debilitate them and knock them out cold on the ground in the street because of the cement. You, we have a thing called shoulder pressure in the, in the jaw on the mat. It's bearable. Good grapplers, can that won't even phase them. But you bounce that shoulder into their face whilst their head is bouncing on cement and three or four bounces later they're unconscious. So remember that. Doesn't matter how good you are on the street, always think in terms of staying on top. So that's the principle that I want to look at. A block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw. It's intimately related to your mastery of transitions from one range to the other. And if you're primarily a kicker, you need to work on improving your punches. If you're primarily a puncher, you need to work on improving your transition to the inside, to the headbutt, the elbow. If they're headbutting elbow, you need to work on your transition to the stand-up gyokute grappling range. And if you're good in the stand-up grapple, you better be good on the ground range as well because each range trumps the range before it. A good kicker against a good puncher, the good puncher will get inside and win. If the good puncher doesn't know how to get inside, watch the head butts and elbows and stand-up grapple, he'll lose. And someone who's good at the stand-up grapple, doesn't matter how good you are at the stand-up grapple, against someone who has mastered groundwork, they will take you down and reverse you and make it very, very difficult. So the connection between block, lock, blow, throw and the five ranges and the principle of transition and sticky tape is vital. And that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> but anyway, if you've got any comments, please share them because I'd love to see some dialogue. Rob Wall. Yep. That's the other thing about uh, sport grappling is small digit manipulation is against the rules. But if you get a digit, you bite their finger, you bite and grind their finger until you bite a knuckle off or you bend their fingers and break their fingers. It's surprising sometime if you ever, if you do some grappling every now and then say to your partners, okay, today we're going to carefully allow punches, bites and, and small joint manipulation and go and see what happens. Sometimes it's a good grappler can neutralize all of those by the way he controls you. But if your movement philosophy in the groundwork and the stand-up grapple is purely sport-based, you can get caught out. You'll get your fingers broken, you'll get bitten. Uh, you'll, we even teach the kids when we're doing certain techniques and their, their head has to be right next to the head of their partner, if you say to the kids, how close have you got to be, they will say, the, the dialogue we use in the dojo is you have to be close enough to kiss or bite. So if they're your friend, you can kiss them. If they're not your friend, you're going to bite them. It's that simple. That's a good question, Damien. They don't always translate as blocks, but everything can, I mean, as throws, but everything can. So, for example, where you have the two-hand <clears throat> block here, generally speaking, most karate cards I've seen today do not originate, no, were imported. Yes, I concur. That's why I threw in there um, they got it from China. Masoyama says it's interesting because Mike, for, use, for, for you regulars, you'll know that Mike is the author of a number of, of highly successful, very worthwhile reading books. And one of them is a book called Shingi Tai. And as you know, Shingi Tai means the mind, the technique, and the body. And Masayama says, Shingi Tai, Shin the mind, the fundamental core of Japanese martial arts, the mind principles originate in India. Gi technique, the fundamental core principles of all the Japanese martial arts originates in China and Thai, the physical, the conditioning side of martial arts as we know it, fundamentally originates in Japan. Um, and you can include Okinawa in that. So what Mike is saying, correct of course, um, the Pinan Kata, uh, Kushanku, Kanku, all these Katas, even Yansu and Katas like that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're all imported from China by the 
who, the gentlemen that we now regard as the original Okinawan masters of karate. The old Muay Thai teacher used to say that a punch beats a kick, a knee beats a punch, an elbow beats a knee, and a kick beats an elbow. So there you go. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> I love it when, when people I love and respect uh, say something that is in accord with what, I, you know, there's nothing worse than people saying things that doesn't gel with what I'm saying. But there you go. So fundamentally, the old Muay Thai, punch beats a kick, a kick beats a punch, an elbow beats a knee, and a knee beats an elbow. So what you have is transfer of ranges. You have transition of range. So you can change that. The old Muay Thai teachers used to say that range two beats range one, range three beats range two, and range two beats range three, and range one beats range three. So in other words, mastery of the stand-up ranges allows you to transition from one range uh, to another. That's Yes, that's I like that, and I'm going to go back and look at that again, Adam, and think about it because that's um, without stealing thunder, I, I have a feeling that any smart stand-up fighter would to a degree understand that, but to actually have that um, as a you know as a, a, a an example from Muay Thai is fantastic um, thank you so there you have it I'm really interested to hear more dialogue and and dialogue like that's fantastic um, it's a real pleasure for me to have Adam here and it's always a pleasure and an honor to have Mike Clark here as well so um, if you have a piece of paper write it down block is a lock is a blow is a throw intimately intimately connected to the five ranges the five ranges is de your ability to control the five ranges is determined by your ability to transition without compromising your balance okay even Transitioning from a kick to a punch, if, if your skills aren't right, uh, you'll lose balance. And if your opponent's defense is good, they'll force you to lose your balance. Oh, there, there you go. What you're saying, I think, is what I'm getting at, Adam. Also, who can keep, whoever can keep their stance the best will win. Well, in other words, that's balance because a good stance is based on balance, relaxation, accuracy, good timing, and speed. And all of those re is what makes a good fighting stance. Xiong, which t percentage takes preference in educating ourselves to complement our karate in your opinion? Well, uh, it's an individual thing, but I think the first thing as a karate fighter has to do is understand how to maintain his balance when someone transitions to a closer range and starts to manipulate their balance. So for example, wrestlers use collar ties, underhooks, knee taps, uh, snap downs. Um, these are all techniques that are 100% designed to screw with your balance. Muay Thai has the, the grappling. <laughs> I don't know if you've been cynical, <laughs> but I get uh, Hare Krishna. <laughs> But Muay Thai has the neck, the neck grappling, and the neck grappling is far more than neck grappling. It's not just a matter of neck grappling. It's, it's a mastery of breaking someone's balance to destroy their stance. Correct me if I'm wrong. But when Adam says, whoever can keep their stance, the best will win, Masayama, Masayama said it in different words. He said, the one who loses his balance first is the one who loses the fight first. And like I've said before, it didn't make sense to me when I was a kid because if I fell over, the referee would go, Yame, stop, get up, start again. It's only when I got sat in my ass in the street that I realized there's no set referee. Okay, so beautiful. Do you train specific Mai techniques for transitions or is that simply in the footwork? Well, Mai transitions is primarily footwork. Yeah, you're right. But there are techniques as well. So when I enter in from kicking range to hand range, well, I want to make sure that my hands are in a position 
so that I shut down the kick and move into the hands. But if he's moving into the hands, well, I have to be able to cover. But if I want to get the inside control, and remember, it's always inside control that's of primary importance. Whether you're on the ground or stand up, it's the inside control. So even wrestling, if he gets a collar tie on me, I come in on the inside and I have to control the inside. So transitioning from kick to punch, let's say, and from punch to elbow is determined by your transitional ability to remain to maintain control on the inside. So there are certain techniques that you do. It's not a conscious thing. If you drill the technique properly, your technique should take you to inside control. Inside control is vital at all times. It's it makes sense because let's say he has his hands up, I have his my hands up, but his hands are inside mine, there's nothing I could do because he's just doing this all day. I throw an elbow at him, he just goes like that. For me to make the elbow work, I have to be on the inside. Okay, so that's your primary objective there, Marco, is any techniques transitioning from range to range uh, requires you to transition inside. For me, the study of Carter, rather than just remember the moves, uncovers layers of possibility. Yes, that's true, Mike. And this is why I included that new section in my second edition of the book called Kaisai no Gendi, which was uh, original principle of, I believe, um, Miyagi Chojun brought back a principle from China, which he called Toki Tomusubi no Gendi. Toki, untying, musubi, tying, the principles of untying and tying the key knot points in a kata. And that's uh, that's what the whole study is. And I'm, I love Kyokushin, but remember Kyokushin for 40 years, 50 years now, has been primarily focused on the sporting aspect, namely tournaments. But now that the first generation world fighters are in their 70s and 80s and many of them have passed away, um, oh, us, Aiden, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming. You know, so now we have to take into consideration, and this is, you know, when you had Masayama starting Kyokushin, and you had some of the old, the other styles, particularly Goju and uh, Shotokan, um, they already had second and third and fourth generation people, sec well, probably third generation people. Okay, so when Masayama comes along and turns Kyogish into a fighting sport for young, strong, fit men, the older generation of the other styles would look at it and go, that's not karate, that's just fighting. And they had an argument. There's no denying that what they were saying was true to a point. But the reality is now we find ourselves in Kyogish in the same place where you've got old fellas, 60, 70, 80, who require something more than the full contact tournaments. You can't even maintain that full contact tournaments for the most part after 40, let alone 50, 60, 70, 80. So you go back to the research of the kata. And we have so much to learn in that respect from other traditional, more, well, not traditional, not necessarily, traditional is a funny word, but other styles with a longer history put it that way was Clarence I hope everything's going okay South Africa's under a little bit of a cloud at the moment a lot of unrest so I hope you're safe and well Us. so I'm going to wind it up folks I hope you find that interesting let me recap a block is a lock is a blow is a throw that means you take any technique and you analyze it in terms of those four principles is it a can it be used as a block can it be used as a lock can it be used as a strike or a blow can it be used as a throw and to master those four requires a, a an intimate ability maybe not intimate at least a fundamental ability in transitioning from range one, two, three, four, five, from outside of the kicks all the way to the ground. And remember, 67% of what Solsai taught in his books was not applicable to Kyogushin tournaments. 
that's a lot. A block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw. The five ranges, punch, uh, kick, punch, headbutt, elbow. Some people call that the trapping range. The stand-up grapple or gyaku tear range and the ground range. Transitional mastery requires you to understand that if you go to the ground, you're going to be on the bottom or the top. If you're on the bottom, it's a lot worse than being on the top. So everything you do in terms of your takedown skills, primarily, 80-20 it anyway, primarily should be focused at taking people down and maintaining top position. That's what Masayama taught. Any takedown should finish with you maintaining control and top position. Some techniques won't allow that. Well, then learn them later. Learn them as part of the 20, not part of the 80. But the transition of the controls, I think, um, I think the transitions to the ground, first and foremost, you should work on the idea of finishing on top position on the ground with an ability to control your balance, maintain on the top side. And one of the most important points to do that, this is another area I'd love to pursue, is three-point contact minimum, three or four-point contact. When you go to the ground and someone tries to get you to the ground, if you can maintain three-point contact, I would almost say it's impossible for them to take you to the ground. But any takedown requires that they break your base. And a base requires three or four points of contact, generally speaking, to not be taken down. I'm not talking about sweeps from the standing position. That's a different thing. I'm talking about once you get to the ground and they're trying to take your balance by reversing you from top to bottom, if you can maintain three-point contact, you'll be very hard to switch down, okay? Now remember, control in those positions requires lots of sticky tape. The more sticky tape you, you can get on, the uh, more ability you'll have of maintaining control of your balance. You have to be stable. You have to be stable at all times. A block is a lock. I'll write it. Yes, that's pretty well correct. Yes, that's correct. Uh, block is a lock is a blow is a throw. So thanks again, guys. I hope you find that interesting. All I can say is focus on principles, not techniques. Focus on the possibilities and don't be boarded into a narrow approach. I've literally, I remember once I was at a seminar and I was explaining a certain technique in a card and I'm going to do this and my other hand was relaxed and there was a guy there who I suppose he loved to entertain the idea that he was extremely skilled but when I finished he says that is wrong your other hand should be closed and not here. And I go, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, some people will become very pedantic about the wrong things. But please, I hope you enjoy that. Uh, research it. Research especially the principle of transition from one range to the next. Of course. Thank you, guys. If you haven't joined Patreon, have a look to my Patreon family. Thank you very much. In these unstable times, you're allowing me to do this. Uh, also, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit hit the bell, hit a like, do all that stuff. And if it helps me to grow the channel, I'm really, really happy. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. And Adam, all the way from Bangkok, Kap Kun Kap, thank you for coming. I hope you're safe and well. Mike Clark, Western Australia, Frank from Sweden, Ed from... Uh, I think, where are you from, Ed? I think you're in Florida, is that correct? Paddy in Melbourne, good luck to everyone in Melbourne. Paul Kniep from Germany. Frederick from Sweden. Uh, we even had uh, um, Maz, I think you're from Tassie.
Paul Søren, Søren Sanderson from uh, Denmark, Aiden, in lockdown down at, at um, uh, Wollongong, Clarence, all the way to South Africa, Rachel from uh, Canada. Thanks, guys. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it very much. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Saladikap, saladikap. And uh, if and over time things will settle down, and I'll have more time on my hands to do uh, more. Appreciate it, us everybody. Take care. Stay safe in COVID, and do the right thing. Look after your fellow man, us. Thank you.